Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Pasternak, and I'm the very proud executive director of the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. And it is my great pleasure to welcome a great friend to all of us here in Miami, and especially to us at the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU, Cami Green Hofstadter. Now, how to begin describing and introducing a woman with such a uh, prominent resume. But let me start by saying that she has been educated internationally at the Helsinki School of Law, at the Hague Academy of International Law, and at the University of Geneva. Um, and here in the United States, she has worked as an honorary consul for Finland, and she has served a as a professor in numerous fields. <clears throat> she is internationally and widely published in academic arenas and human interest, and is able to claim, as a result of her newest book, that she is both an award-winning and best-selling author. And we're here to discuss this evening that book, the yellow star that wasn't. And let me describe it for you in the way that Cami describes it herself. Other people may quilt or paint, but I've written five books. One reason with prestigious academic publisher, Paul Grave Macmillan, three award-winning chapters in an anthology, one humor award, my interview of Betty Friedan, the iconic feminist, and numerous articles about academic and human interest topics, both in Swedish and English. This current book is a, is a journey from World War II as a Protestant in Helsinki to her commitment to telling the story about the history of Jews in Scandinavia during World War II from her personal perspective. And I believe this is a, an area of the war about which we rarely hear and how interesting and fabulous that we will be able to hear about it this evening. And so without further ado, I am going to introduce to you, Cami Green Hofstadter. Thank you so much, Susan. You know, I hold FIU in high regard. Um, I taught school law there for 12 years. And I'm also a rather frequent lecturer at the FIU OLLI. And my son graduated from law school at FIU. So I just have close FIU ties. In any case, I think we hear somebody talking, but can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a person that all of us know very well, Miriam Kasanoff, director of the Holocaust Education of uh, Dade County Public Schools, interviewed me. Tonight, I'm a self-directed person, uh, like I did for a recent book club. So I welcome that opportunity to, to actually take this author talk in the direction that I like. This is definitely not a book read. I look at it from a different angle. And therefore, I have to bring in the name of one of my favorite authors, Eric Larson, the In the Garden of the Beast, 2011, and Churchill, The Splendid and the Vile in 2020. I went to both of those, quote, book reads, and he started off saying, I will not be reading for you, and I want to just stand up and clap my hands because I do not personally like author talks when, when the writer just sits or stands and reads 
from his or her book. Instead, I'm going to talk about the process from an idea to being an Amazon bestseller. I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then leave about um, 15 minutes for questions. Now, pl please post your questions in the chat and we'll get to those. Uh, this is not a slide presentation either. I start, there's a reason for why, why I have the background slide uh, posted as, as you see it now. I would ask that you pay attention, at least note the second line, a Swede in Helsinki, because that's a very important part of my journey to Jewish awareness. Um, traditionally, teachers have relied on textbooks, as we know, on the general history of World War II to fulfill their state's mandates to teach what happened during the Holocaust years. But in one of the recent surveys, a professor, a Holocaust professor is quoted as saying, he does not think that the subject should be taught just as history because then it becomes easy for the students to say, it happened then, it happened there, it has no relevance here. Likewise, I hope when you read the book, you don't get sidetracked with my stories, my personal recollections, but absorb the facts of Jewish history from that period. So back to the first slide, I only have a handful. Uh, you notice the Swedish part. When I was born, and raised in Helsinki, Swedes numbered 10% of the population. I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. I could never fit into the society. We Swedes were many times harassed. I was kicked by fellow play, uh, playmates, Finnish speaking playmates. So I grew up with that feeling that I did not belong in Finland, even though it was a country, my, the country of my birth. Today, by the way, the uh, um, ratio of, or the number of uh, Swedes in Finland is only 5%. Years later, a rabbi in Helsinki was quoted as saying, that's about maybe eight years ago, that today, it's easier to be a Jew than a Swedish speaking Finn. So that gives me, gives you a little bit of an idea of my, the first years in Finland. I'm trying to, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Hit the, arrow. It, Hit the arrow key, can you? I do, I do. Nothing is happening. Can you move it from your end? Nope. I don't oh, shoot. <laughs> there, I did it with my finger. Oh, there we screen. go, perfect. Yes, all right, so this is just a, a, a brief glimpse of my roots. The top two left is my grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side. Years later in Miami, somebody would ask me if my grandfather was a camp survivor because of his looks. He was not. They were not Jewish. Um, they were Protestants. They, although he functioned in what was considered a, a traditionally Jewish field of business, and that was in furs and leather and shoes. On the bottom picture, you can see uh, his, the, the um, large building is his leather tannery. Now, and, and the smaller building is what, what was considered a very advanced home at the time. 
unfortunately, he lost it all shortly after I was born. On the right side, the young fellow in the front is my father. Um, at school, I knew one or two Jewish students and they were very exciting to me because they were different. 95% of the population were Protestants and the rest were a mix of a few Catholics, a few Jews, and a few other smaller religions. I was extremely fascinated and envious of these exotic other people, if I may use that term, because they were different. And I too <laughs> wanted to stand out. I wanted to be different in the good way, in the exotic way that they, they did. So this is my family. I'm, I'm the young girl, the youngest in the family of three. And the, the suitcase that my sister carried became a symbol for me, to, for my longing to travel to faraway countries. I had no idea where I was gonna be, but I wanted to get away from an early age. And when my uncle, who is on the right side, visited in 1952 from Toronto, he had emigrated to Toronto shortly after the First World War. When he, he came to visit in 1952, that was a banner year for me because that was also the year when Helsinki was overrun by people we had never seen before because we hosted the Olympics. So there were black players, the Israel participated for the first time. Um, these were exciting times for me, but they also fed into my desire to get away. I was looking for a home. I, it's hard to describe from an early age, but I did. Fortunately, um, and I I'm talking about these events in my book. Fortunately, I had an opportunity to attend the University of Geneva. And that's where I had my very first, shall we say, close encounter with a Jewish girl from another country. She was from Iran. And my girlfriend and I were scheduled to, well, the whole class were scheduled to go to um, visit one of the international organizations that were headquartered in Geneva. And on the day of that excursion, my girlfriend developed a very high temperature. She was bedridden. Well, since I had had my eye on a very cute American boy, I thought nothing about of leaving her alone. I said, I'll see you later. And I took off. Before I took off, this girl who introduced herself as not only, well, she didn't say at that time she was Jewish. She was from Iran. She told me to just go and have a good time. Uh, she was gonna take care of my girlfriend. And at the end of the day, when I returned, my girlfriend was sitting in bed with a bowl of chicken soup tended to by this girl from Iran. And I was in awe because it had never crossed my mind to help my girlfriend out. So I, I asked, uh, Puran was her name, Puran, why was she so helpful? to somebody she didn't know. And she said sort of nonchalantly, well, that's part of our, what I thought she said, that's part of our mythos. That's how I recorded it in my journal, M-I-T-T-O-S. 
of course, what she was saying was metvas. Um, then a year later, I had the opportunity to represent Finland at the International Court of Justice. You see a picture of all of us young law students or lawyers from Scandinavia. And at that time, I met and fell in love with a very exotic fellow, a Catholic American, I instantly became, um, if not the, the object of envy among my fellow law students back home, but certainly they were extremely curious about this Catholic American boy that I had fallen in love with. And as you can see on the bottom picture, we ended up getting married. So, 20 years later, well, I'm not gonna jump over actually what happened in between. This is only a sample and I'm getting to it of the titles that I used for my research. When I married my Catholic American student husband and he graduated law school, we decided to settle in Miami. We didn't know anybody else. He became an associate of a large law firm. So naturally the only friends we had were other young new associates. One of them stood out to me because he was strangely interested in the Danish king and he wanted details. Well, I had no clue and he was talking about the king who was on the throne during the, the war years, not the, the current one or, or the subsequent one. And I could not for the life of me understand why he had an interest in somebody like that. As a matter of fact, I started getting quite annoyed because I kept thinking to myself, doesn't he know the difference between Denmark and Finland? It also made me think back of the summer jobs that I had held while in law school in Helsinki, uh, when I had served as a tourist guide, receiving these groups from off the cruise ships in Helsinki. And I guided tours in, in two languages, well, three if you count Swedish, but German and English. And um, most of my guests, if you will, were um, Americans. And I had noticed already then that people were asking me about the quote, Jewish situation in Finland. And again, I was puzzled. Why would anybody be interested in that? What was the fascination with that? And besides, I didn't have any answers. And I remember one American fellow asking me, how are the Jews doing in Finland? And I very flippantly answered, oh, there are no poor people in Finland, um, implying that there are no poor Jews in Finland. Uh, which today really scorches your ears. But back then, out of either stupidity or innocence, that's how I answered. So then 20 years later and two sons later, my Catholic American husband and I went through a very friendly divorce. And my Jewish journey took another turn as I was swept off totally swept off my feet by a Jewish man on Miami Beach, who was soon to be diagnosed, medically diagnosed as an obsessive compulsive, who sincerely believed history could have changed if the Jews in Europe only had had guns. So for the first time I was introduced to guns. He kept a loaded gun next to his bed in the glove compartment of his car. And he had quite an arsenal 
in a steel box bolted to the floor of his apartment. His message was always that Jews in America were not safe. We spent an inordinate amount of time watching Holocaust videos, and he'd talk about the Nazi horrors for what now seems forever. But then he died. And we hadn't managed to get the wedding off the ground. So it fell on me to help the estate with preparing the apartment for sale, et cetera, et cetera. His co extensive collection of everything, because his OCD came with, with a serious case of hoarding, as you can imagine, included a dozen plus cartons of Holocaust related books. And it took me a long, long time to find a home for them. Um, I, I really didn't know what to do with all of his collections. I ended up throwing out a lot of books. Fortunately, none of the war or Holocaust related ones. But I was very curious that he had had nothing specifically on Scandinavia. So all of a sudden, I started collecting them myself. And this is only a small sample of them. Fortunately, I am versant in all Scandinavian language. I don't speak them all, but I certainly read them. And then something serendipitous happened. Now he's gone, I'm on my own. I'm beginning to build up my own collection of Scandinavian research. And out of the clear blue, I had a call from Dana Klein, who was and still is the honorary consul of Macedonia, who had started an international speaker series at the Holocaust Education Center in Hollywood. Today it's in Dania Beach, as we know. And she asked me to come and talk about what happened to the Jews in Finland. And she warned me and said, we really don't know how many people are gonna come. We have had 20, not, uh, 20 people is a, a, a good number. Um, so we'll see what happens. I said, I don't mind. I'll talk to 20, I'll talk to five, it doesn't matter. Well, they packed the room, um, standing room only, 120 people, not because of a, a reputation that I might have had because I didn't have one, but it obviously showed that there was a great interest in that geographic region of the world. And then I started getting more and more requests, not just to talk about Finland, but to talk about Scandinavia. And in the book, I discuss also the trend that I saw developing at that time. At the end of my presentations, I could almost bet my bottom dollar that the first question would be, are you Jewish? And the second question would be, why are you so interested in the topic? And then people started saying, you ought to write a book about it. So that idea was germinating in my mind for a few years. But I didn't want to put together a book that was so filled with boring and dull historical facts that today, of course, you can look up online. Um, so I decided, based on my experience with these groups, that I needed to somehow insert myself in the book too. People were so interested in my stories, but I hesitated. It went against my personality and my background. We don't talk about ourselves. We certainly don't share any of the good things that we have, have done in our lives. 
So in short, I didn't just one day sit down and write a book. It was a, a generic process from those lect lectures that started over a decade ago to eventually putting the book together. Um, it's not my first book. This is a little bit of a facetious um, slide here. I wrote my first book <laughs> when I was seven years old, Trolletti Skogen, which means the troll in the, in the woods. And on the back of these cardboard covers that I drew, I wrote in Swedish by the world famous, by a world famous authoress. <laughs> uh, fast for forward a couple of decades, I guess it would have been, to who, the time when James Michener, he on the right side, consented to be interviewed by me for the Swedish newspaper in, in Finland. And I told him this story in an effort to lighten him up, him up because he was a very serious man and um, not given to smiling or anything. So I told him the story and he politely smiled or gave me a half smile. We conducted the interview. And as I walked out of his house, he turned to me and he, said, he cracked a smile. He said, you know, my threshold has never been crossed before by a world famous author, authoress. And then he laughed really heartily. Um, Nancy, you can stop the share, I guess, because that's the end of my slides. I you have gonna... to stop the share. Sorry, thank you. You have to stop the share. Yep, yep, there we go. There I am again. So on a more serious note, obviously, I've had a lifelong passion for writing as evidenced by more than 70 diaries I've kept since I was seven years old and I still have them all. And as Susan pointed out in her introduction, other people may quilt or paint, but I write just for pleasure, I write. Um, both in academic venues as well as in human interest areas in which I have received a couple of awards. No need to go over that again. Now, as you can see from my presentation, I have not bored you with the facts of history of what happened to Scandinavia, but I'm gonna give you a couple of just pointers so you can put Scandinavia in context when you read my book. And that is the fact that in April 1940, Hitler in, invaded both Norway and Denmark on the very same day, April 9th. Sweden immediately declared itself neutral and Finland tried to remain neutral. It's very important for us Finns to share the message that Finland was never occupied by Hitler. At one point, we joined forces with him to fight against Stalin. And that created a very peculiar situation in that Finnish Jewish soldiers ended up fighting next to German Nazi soldiers that Hitler sent to our country to help us fight against Stalin's attacks. Sweden is a totally different story. Like I said, it declared itself neutral. Meanwhile, it was trading uh, with Nazi Germany and also allowed um, Hitler to transport war material, etc., across its territory. 
to occupied Norway. I think most of us know in general terms, at least the Danish story, but the Norwegian story is different in that the Norwegians really put up a fight that lasted for about three months and, and then they gave up, they had no choice. Um, I like to always see when I give a presentation in what direction the audience likes to go. So if we have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. I don't want to spend too much time on the war years unless that's of your interest. But all those details are part of my book, um, along with my personal anecdotes, as I told you. So if anybody would like to start off with questions, now is the time, otherwise there's a lot of other stuff that I can talk about. What's your pleasure? So if you have a question, please uh, type it into um, the chat. Oh, okay, yes. Elaine, Elaine Ledbeck, who is a, uh, actually a docent at the Jewish Museum, she wants you to explain the title of your book. Well, that's a very interesting thought too. Um, of course, the yellow star that wasn't uh, is a play of a common belief that's not as much prevailing as it used to be in that the story li lived on for years that the King of Denmark wore the yellow star in, in loyalty to the Danish Jews. And as we know, that was not the truth. So, I wanted that to me be my main title, but once I started including memoristic recollections about me from my from that life, um, well, throughout my life, the I needed a subtitle that would indicate that it was also a memoir. It was a historical memoir. And that's why I said Scandinavia, Miami, and me. So Barbara Rivoli writes, she wants to know a little bit about your life and the Jews in Finland. But my life and the Jews in Finland. Maybe it's two separate questions about your life in Finland and the Jews in Finland. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, the Jews in Finland today or back then? Barbara? Well, what, talk a little bit about your life in Finland yes. when you were a young person. Okay. Well, I, uh, I sort of alluded to the fact that uh, our family who was Protestant um, did not, have Jewish friends, not by choice. It was just the small Jewish population, which numbered only 1,500 and still numbers only 1,500. Back then, the population was only four and a half million. Today, it's, it has increased to five million, but the Jewish population has remained steady around 1,500. And they, the Jews um, related better to the Swedish speaking Finns because of the similarities in Yiddish and Swedish and German. So therefore I ended up with two Jewish girls in my school, not at the same time, but nevertheless. And uh, it was not something that you really spoke about. It was just, um, I mean, nobody discussed religion, period. We had to study religious history at school. So we all knew about Judaism. And as a matter of fact, in an effort to be different, it was very di important for me to be 
different. I didn't want to just blend in. I wanted to stand out somehow. I didn't know how, but I wanted to be different. Uh, so when our history teacher, our religious history teacher, assigned us um, an essay, she said, choose any holiday you want and write about it. So of course, everybody in my class wrote about, you know, Christmas, Easter, whatever, midsummer, whatever. I was the only one who wrote about Pesach. <laughs> and I think it annoyed her because I was a very strong writer already back then. And I usually ended up with A's in all my essays. Well, she added a long minus to, to the A. Um, was there anti-Semitism when I grew up? According to today's historians, there wasn't really. It, it was, might have been latent, but people don't, didn't talk about it. And as a matter of fact, in 1938, after the Anschluss, when Austrian Jews had to find a, a safe haven, they, um, I don't know if they, well, they bought, bought tickets on a ship to Helsinki. It was a Finnish ship. And they arrived in the port of Helsinki, 65 Jews, 60 on the first time in August of 1938. And the immigration officials had no idea what to do with them. We didn't have any policy. We didn't, nobody really knew what to do with them. So they were admitted and they were the fortunate ones because they settled in Finland. Their goal was really to reach uh, Sweden but Sweden closed it, its borders uh, in, in the beginning of the 1940s to uh, Jewish refugees from Finland. Uh, so much for their neutrality, right? And um, then a week after that first shipload, the second shipload allow, uh, arrived. And at that time, um, th there were much more restrictions, only three month permits. They were turned away. Um, some of them could not enter. It was, it was a mess. Uh, a common question that we get, we Finns, is about what happened to the Jews that remained in Finland after peace arrived. And for years, we would take great pride in saying, Finland did not deport any of its Jews, which it didn't technically. Nobody who was a Finnish citizen was deported, but um, eight people, eight Jews without the proper permits were deported and seven of them were killed. One survived and settled in Israel after the war. Um, Oh, <laughs> you so Elizabeth wants to know. Yes, I see that. Exotic. That's a, exotic. Yeah, that's my my choice of words. Obviously, um, anybody who was different to me was exotic, and. The most beautiful girl in my, let's see, that would be fourth grade, fourth grade class was the Jewish girl that I referred to before. Um, she has had such a pretty face, pretty smile. The, the rest of us has never cracked a smile. It was not permissible. We were always serious, stern looking, never smiled, never laughed. And there she was 
not giggling or, or lighthearted about anything, but she always had such a beautiful smile. That made her exotic to me. Um, and just her, her looks, you know, we all had this, this terrible hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't keep curls in mind, that's for sure. And um, she, her hair was always so nicely done up and curly and with a smiley face. And I would study her, not because she was Jewish, but because she was exotic and she was different. Um, yeah, I guess that answers your question about your acquaintance. So Cami, if somebody wants to get a copy of the book, is there some suggestions on where they could get it? Well, yes, any, any bookstore, of course, would carry it and including books and books. And if they don't have it in stock, they'll get it for you. That's for sure. Uh, it's in paperback. I, I think it's uh, twelve ninety nine. It's on Kindle and Nook for four ninety nine. Um, so you have plenty of choices. And um, so, is there, are there any other questions? If you'd like, you can. But we'll, let you speak if you'd like. Yeah, well, there are a couple of things, I guess, oh, that so I there would is, like to draw. There is a yeah. question from Lori about the Danish Jews who were relocated to Sweden during the war. Oh, yeah. She says Raoul Wallenberg. Oh, yes. Raoul Wallenberg, of course, Warren saw must have a separate lecture, not really, but but I mean, he was a prominent figure in the history of the war. Now, when I first came to Miami, as I told you, the, um, the young law associate that I referenced um, was insistent that not only did the king wear the, the um, armband, in loyalty to the Jews, but also that all the Jews were saved overnight. Um, they fled to, they managed to flee to Sweden. Well, that's not quite accurate. Um, the, the majority of the Danish Jewish population lived in Copenhagen. And for them to flee across the, the, the waters that look so, in, uh, it, easy on a map, but are in fact very treacherous waters. For them to cross those waters was extremely dangerous. First, they had to leave Copenhagen, find some sort of a secret transport to um, some sort of place by the water, small town, small village. And then they had to pay fishermen a fair some of them did it for free uh, and to transport them across the waters. Um, there are a lot of interesting stories still coming out today about how people were saved. Uh, some Danes who did it for free, like I implied, some Jews who just wanted to navigate themselves and capsized. Uh, and died, a few, we're not talking big numbers in that regard. And, and um, once they arrived in Sweden, they were welcomed with open arms, generally speaking, while their fellow countrymen were taking care of their properties on the Danish side. Now there is a little, interesting story about that that I have included in my book. The Swedes were, as I implied already, not so willing to just welcome any Jews that wanted to enter their border. If you have not seen Atlantic Crossing, by the way, that TV series, I forget what channel it, it was on, but look it up on your, uh, I, I'm sure it's in reruns by now. 
uh, Atlantic crossing. It talks about the close connection between the royal houses in Norway and Sweden and how the crown princes of Norway, we're not talking Jewish, I'm, I'm coming back to that, um, sought refuge with her uncle, who was the king of Sweden, and he more or less threw her out. And that's how she ended up fleeing to America. But so Sweden was not as holier than thou than that we like to think today. At any case, what happened when um, the Jews started communicating with the Swedish authorities, uh, asking for permission to enter Swedish territory, uh, Bohr, you know, the physicist, uh, was whisked to Sweden at that time with the plan of being further transported to um, America where he was gonna work on the Manhattan Project. Well, he, who was either half Jewish or quarter Jew, depending on what historical source you believe. As the story goes, he requested an audience with the King of Sweden and said, unless you go on the radio and tell everybody that Sweden will welcome the Danes, I'm not going to America. And the king went on the radio to address them. All right. Um, oh, Raoul Wallenberg. He was what we call, the Swedish literal, literature calls a reluctant he hero. He did not set up out to save the Jews at all. He came from a very prominent banking family and he had a lot of Hungarian connections and a close family friend approached him and asked him if he could do something about saving his family in Budapest. And uh, the, the joint distribution, I think it was the joint distribution committee, I can't remember was that or the, no, the war board, the American war board, um, provided the funds and said, if you go, we'll provide the funds for you. Um, and little by little, he was drawn into falsifying passports. And what he did was really a tremendous job at his own peril. And as you know, uh, in January 45, that was the last time he was seen alive in, in Budapest. He was appro approached by Russian officials and whisked away. And my Swedish book sources claim that he was a very naive man who would go with anybody who approached him. And, and he was led away. And there are rumors that he died in a Soviet prison sometimes in the 50s. Um, Scott, I think this yeah. will probably be the last question, but uh, Deborah. Uh, Steinberg wants to know if your parents knew of your interest in the Jews, and if so, what was their reaction? Good question. Well, my father taught religious history, philosophy, and psychology. That was a common combination back then. And he wrote the Swedish textbook of religious history that was used throughout all the Swedish schools in Finland. Because of his interest in history, religious history, he also knew Hebrew. He studied the, the Bible in Hebrew. Obviously he knew a lot about Judaism. A lot of friends have asked me over the years if 
I ever had a sense that anybody in my family was anti-Semitic. It was not something that we ever discussed. My father spoke very highly of the Jewish accomplishments uh, around the world, but he was also a very, very committed Protestant. So then they were both dead by the time I started, um, well, when I lived with my fiance, the one who introduced me, who really introduced me to um, Jewish life, we went to visit. My father was still alive, barely alive. My mother had already died. And when we got to his apartment in Helsinki, my father, who really didn't speak any English, a few words here and there, uh, sort of smiled and he went to his bookcase and he pulled out the, the Bible in Hebrew to show it to my then fiance. And um, other than that, you know, we all live with regrets. I wish I had discussed it with him, asked him more questions, but I didn't. Um, I mean, he was very proud over the fact that I wrote an essay about Pesach. I remember that. He was always very proud over my writings. Um, my mother, on the other hand, <laughs> you'll have to read my book about that. <laughs> I couldn't do anything right in her book. Well, her, her recollections are, are amazing. Um, uh, on behalf of um, Susan had to drop off, she's not been feeling well, but I wanted to thank you. It's Nancy Cohen from the museum. And I want to thank you for sharing this story with us, Cammie. It's always fascinating, uh, your, your recollections of growing up and all these stories and certainly growing, being in Miami Beach and, and, and interacting with all, all the interesting people that you met certainly has affected your story, but it's, it's truly so remarkable. So thank you again. This is like thank the you. first of our Monday Night at the Museum series back again. And we're going to be doing some more going forward in January with uh, Professor Parfit and a whole bunch of Monday Night at the Museum. This week, though, uh, we're going to shift a little bit. We've got the Hello Gorgeous exhibit that opened up telling the story of Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. I don't think she spent any time in Finland or in Sweden, but you never know. Um, <laughs> there's a, they're filming, they're showing um, a What's Up Doc at the JCC on December 8th. They're gonna be showing it outside. So if you're worried about being indoors, it's uh, it's a perfect time to go do that. And uh, Thursdays at three this week, which is the series that our curator, Jacqueline Goldstein hosts. She'll be speaking with Lou Papalas and Warren Klein about the Hello Gorgeous exhibit. So everything you ever wanted about Barbara Streisand, but we're afraid to ask. You could ask the question on Thursday at three o'clock. So once again, thank you for being part of our Monday at the Museum series and for supporting the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. And I hope everybody had a happy Hanukkah and a nice, uh, a nice holiday season to come. Thanks again. Thank, thank you for having me.